quickly get into the second end of the conversation, uh, gentlemen. And it has to do with Mr. President being in the Upper West Region, why specifically, and talking about the insurgency threat in the sub-region and how it has become very real to us. He also then makes mention of a number of things. He talks about the fact that, look, uh, they are doing a lot when it comes to logistics and, uh, you know, equipping our security services. He, I mean, if you recall, in recent times, a thousand motorbikes uh, were given to the Ghana Police Service, all in a bid to ensure that our security services have the wherewithal to deal with uh, such situations. But then, on the other hand, we also have some of the situations we are seeing where in our border areas there are problems. We speak about how porous uh, the borders are and all of that. I'll start with you, uh, James Agalga, on this matter. When the president says they are doing everything, government is doing everything in its power to ensure that we are protected, uh, what, what is your reaction? Is that what you see? Is that the picture? Uh, well, to the extent that we haven't recorded any um, terrorist attack on our soil yet, Yes, one we want to give the security apparatus of our country um, credit. Uh, but President, of course, would want to um, say he has done everything under the sun to bring that about by way of um, retooling, resourcing the uh, security agencies. There is some element of truth in that. No, no, that you can't deny the fact that uh, over the period they, there has been some attempt to expand, for instance, the military. And so he can go to war. We now have the 10 mechanized battalions in, in, in war. But the point needs to be made that these things didn't just happen overnight. For instance, the 10 mechanized battalions was, was, was established. Plants were far advanced. The infrastructure that now houses 10 mechanized battalions started way back even before President Akufo-Addo uh, took over as president of this country. I am ranking member for the Defense and uh, Interior Committee. We sit on the budget of the security agencies. And I can tell you, year in, year out, when they come, they lament bitterly about the fact that the government hasn't resourced them sufficiently well to execute their mandate of protecting all, all, all of us. And so if you ask me, my personal view is that government needs to up its game, given the fact that we are now faced with the, uh, the threat of terror along our northern frontier. There are a myriad of security challenges that we are now confronted with. And so, uh, rather than take credit for the successes that have been chopped, I think we should do well in terms of um, resourcing the security agents. The 10 mechanized battalion in, in the Upper West, for instance, we went there not too long ago. I'm talking about the security committee to do some investigation. And it came to light that that unit itself is still uh, in its formative um, stages. They don't have the full complement of the numbers that ordinarily they would require to make up a complete battalion. So a lot more logistics need to be uh, given to that particular battalion in the Upper West Region. You have its counterpart in the Upper East, the 11 mechanized battalion. As, as a new battalion, naturally, they will have a lot of challenges, accommodation challenges, etc. And let me make the point that as we speak, you, you cannot have close to half of your force living within the civilian uh, you know, population, living among them. They don't live in barracks accommodation. That undermines the, the, the discipline of the um, services. It, it compromises uh, command and control because if you can imagine if your personnel are living in very distant, on the periphery of the city. You want them to report for work at 7. 
mobilization becomes a challenge if they are unable to report at say seven because the person leaves at Kaswa. Can you blame them? Mm. That in itself is a factor that we need to uh, take on, on board. If we have all agreed that let's expand our security services, then we must work hard to ensure that the acute accommodation challenges that uh, they are confronted is, is, is dealt with um, and, and, and very expeditiously. Right. Uh, let, me, let me bring in uh, Prof. Uh, so James is right when he talks about the fact that, yes, uh, we've done something when it comes to logistics, but we could do uh, a, a lot more as well, especially considering the threat that was re-echoed by Mr. President. He spoke about the Sahel region, Burkina Faso and Mali, and no one needs to be told what has happened in those uh, jurisdictions. But from where you sit, you're very close to the military. Have we done enough by way of logistics so far? Let me start by saying that otherwise I agree with James on most of the things that he has said. Uh, let us be clear in our mind. Where terrorism is concerned, no country can say that I am now secure, I have done enough. The word enough doesn't come in. If you don't believe me, check 9-11. If 19 people could really show that America is after all not invincible, then you should know that no, no amount of preparation would assure you of non-interference uh, uh, by, by the terrorists. You know, they don't come with a flag, and they are very intelligent. And so I think the government is doing very well. I must confess, the FOBs that have been put up are very, very important. They can't have that luxury of barracking and that kind of thing in the initial stages. It's going to be very difficult, really. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> resourcing the military is one of the biggest problems of uh, defense management for every country. And so as the exigencies come, that's how we try and tackle them. The government is doing fine. But I will never say that what they have done is enough. And it will never be enough where terrorism is concerned. At least the Accra Initiative, the FOBs, and those things that the government are doing are all initiatives that are very good to try and counter terrorism. One thing that is missing is maybe the population ourselves. How... Have we created awareness among the population? I was happy when the president was talking about the communities, the frontline communities. If you leave them, the terrorists take them as they are, whatever it is, and then they are the ones who feed them and whatnot, and then they have friends among the terrorists. So the frontier communities need to be taken care of, and they will be the ones who are smart enough to see something and say something. So the government is doing well, but let me warn that nothing is enough. No amount of whatever it is will be enough. The population must be made very much aware of the threat of terrorism. At times, some of them don't even believe it. They don't think that it exists. The last time they attacked, they were only about a kilometer or two away from the borders of Ghana. Right. And they want to link up actually with the littoral countries. They want the littoral countries to be able to link up with their counterparts, the transnational organized criminals uh, using the sea. So we must know that terrorism has no... Uh, what do you call it, uh, well-defined borders where we say, as for this, we have locked the borders and therefore they can't come. They are amongst us. Once they recruit from here, at times they may not attack. They may not even attack Ghana. They may want Ghana as a haven for doing their business. Right. Yes, and we have instance, our research shows that Ghana is one of the places where the terrorists may not necessarily attack. In because it's, it's, it's convenient for them, like convenient Professor Enning has them. shared with us. It's convenient exactly. for them. They it's run away from Burkina Hyde over here. They have business over here to support their operations, etc., etc. They've been doing it, whether it is Boko Haram or uh, what do call it, uh, uh, Al Shabab or whatever it is. They want places where they can use a, a platform, lily pad, as they, they call them. You know, would you believe that if you Google the uh, Kima 2040, you would realize that $540,000 reached Ghana and fizzled out wow. in 2014. Mm. What for people are still investigating how that money came through Ghana. Mm. You know, so we should be very careful about these things. And in some instances, they establish very big companies and then the countries are very happy that, and they boast that they have been able to procure some foreign direct investors into the country, as we normally do in Ghana. Every government tries to boast about how much foreign direct invest investment he has brought into the country. Some of them may be terrorist organizations. We don't know. 
you know. So these are the things we should be, be vigilant about. Whilst we are resourcing the military, we should right. also be vigilant about these things. That's mm. very important. Uh, hold, hold for me, Prof. Let me bring in uh, Mukhtar as well, who is in the studio. So, yes, we're talking about uh, improving the logistical base. Mr. President has said, for example, that uh, the, in the last budgets, you know, th they had made uh, arrangements for the conditions of service of the military in terms of bettering the conditions of service of the military, uh, among others. But when you look at the situation in the sub-region, like uh, Prof would say, there's a whole lot of work that ought uh, to be done. M Mr. President has also called for that engagement mm. between the military and civilians or the security forces and civilians to ensure that, you know, we have that campaign. If you see something, say something so that uh, this, nothing will happen on our blind side, especially in the border areas. Yeah. Uh, how do you think that is going to work? Yes, uh, first of all, I think I, I agree <clears throat> with uh, Prof and uh, Honorable James Agaga on the, the you know, the commitments of the, of the government in terms of preparation against terrorism. Um, I'm privy to a lot of things that are happening, and there seem to be a lot going on in terms of Ghana's preparation against uh, the threat from the Sahel, and also from even the internal sources of the threat. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, initiatives around joint border patrols, so that they, what we call Operation Kundanglu, Operation Conquered Fist, uh, Operation Eagle Claw, and several other initiatives that allows you know, joint border patrols and you know, interagency coordination and intelligence sharing, which is key if you're looking at the threat from external sources. And we've seen from the National Security, the Counterterrorism Unit of the National Security in the last two years uh, has been quite you know, uh, busy trying to put things together. And they put together a national framework for preventing and countering uh, violent extremism. It's quite an elaborate, uh, comprehensive document. Uh, it's very difficult to criticize the, that document beyond the minute, uh, but it's a catch somewhere that uh, we will talk about. Yes, the president's call to deepen you know, the relationship between the security and civilian population is key. We've seen the launch of See Something, Say Something. That public, you know, uh, it, it allows the public to engage or to work and communicate, report incidences, of suspicions or threats and things like that. But dealing with the threat goes beyond declarations of public taglines like that. We need a national, deliberate national education campaign mm. to engage local community members in areas we call suspect communities or vulnerable communities, including the border communities, to understand what it means to engage or work with the state in helping to prevent terrorism from happening here. If you see something, say something. What do you see? What would you see and say something? What constitutes a threat? What are the signs that somebody potentially is looking to, you know, engage in an attack? Somebody is planning, somebody is engaging in a conduct that can possibly lead to an attack. These are things that we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. There is no way we can win against terrorism by hardcore combat measures. The battle against terrorism cannot be won on the battlefield alone. It will be won in the mindset, in the local community. The battle of the mind as well. In the local communities, in addressing the vulnerabilities and the drivers of radicalization and engaging local populations to understand what the threat is and how they can engage by volunteering relevant information to security agencies, by engaging and shaping you know, each other's conduct, peer influence, and engaging in conversation and actions that are supportive of peace. These things are key. We have to go beyond the see something, see some, say something tagline to design a deliberate national education campaign that gives meaning to the whole of society approach to dealing with the threat. Other than that, I fear to say we don't want to be overtaken, you know, overwhelmed by events. And so we need to do that now. And I think that there is adequate foundation that has been laid from the perspective of National Security Ministry and the Counterterrorism Unit. We need civil society's engagement. At the moment, we don't have that. There's very little sense of engagement with civil society and state security actors in dealing with it. And I think that it has to begin now. Luckily, we have a new national security you know, coordinator that gives an impression that he comes with a, a new sense of urgency and energy. 
And I think that it has to incorporate the element of civil society and the local population to counter or deal with the threat. Mm. And that's an interesting aspect. As, as, as we, you know, sew up the conversation, gentlemen, hold for me, Prof and James. I would like to add this twist to it. And I would have both of you, uh, Prof and James, uh, when Mumune is done, to also react to what he's talking about, how we're going to go about getting the people really involved. But the second aspect is Boku and the simmering tensions there. So 10 mechanized battalion in the Upper West region were to be specific, but uh, James was also talking about the 11 mechanized regiment mm. in the Upper East region. And that's where we have Boku and everything that has been happening. How much of a threat is that in itself in terms of, you know, because once you are divided within, mm. you open yourself up to elements coming with such mindsets. Mm -hmm. How much of a problem is the Boku situation in light of this discussion we're having? I think it's a huge, huge security threat. It's a huge security threat to the people of Boku and the area of Boku and to the nation at large. If you look at it in the context of terrorism, there is a report we have variously cited in our reports relating to the threats uh, that suggests that over 97% of all terrorism fatalities uh, this is a report by the Global Terrorism Index for 2020 and 2021. Uh, reveals that over 97% of all terrorism fatalities happened in countries that are already in conflict. Mm. It tells you the pervasive that is role. Within. Yes. It tells you the huge role or huge factor existing conflicts play in terrorist violence because terrorists are highly, highly exploitative. They have a huge exploitative capacity. They take advantage of vulnerabilities within the system to recruit or to engage in attacks or both. And so that's why we see Boko as a huge security, I mean, a huge danger uh, to this, in this context. Uh, but I have been in that space in the last uh, couple of months. In fact, I just came back from Boko West. Uh, that includes a place called Bansi which is very close to the border with uh, Burkina Faso. Right. And you may have uh, read recently that there's some infiltration of uh, citizens, refugees, who are yeah, seeking yeah, refuge. Yeah. So some of them... That's part of why I even brought in... Okay, so some of these, uh, you know, are in that part. And my reading is that there are a lot of security challenges in there in terms of security deployment and the, the kinds of... the conduct of security officials and all that. But we've seen increased security presence. Um, a commendable thing is that I have seen increased security presence and checkpoints. If you take even... Uh, before you get to Borga from Tamale, you see several security checkpoints. And some of them actually do a good job because uh, we uh, experimented using public transports um, with seven, eight seater, these vehicles that go very, very often in the area uh, from either Borga to Navrongo, Borga to Tamale, Borga to Zebila, or Borga to Bokwe in those areas. And you see security and that conducts, you know, this uh, command this checkpoints with immigration officials. And I've, I've been in a situation where, you know, a car is stopped and they look through, you know, through their own profiling and ask the gentleman, based on their own profile, of course, you know, uh, where are you coming from? And we're coming from, uh, moving from Borga into Tamale. The guy says he's moving, he's going to Tamale, he's from, from Borga. Can I see your Ghana card? And the guy pulls out his Ghana card. He looks at it and says, okay, move on. And so I asked the question, so if you didn't have a Ghana card, what would happen? And they gave other alternatives. So there are situations where they could check your phone, take your phone, look at the numbers, what numbers are in the phone, who, who are your contacts and all that. Aftermath, I'm not sure what, how. They, so it's an element of security they are dealing with. And I get the sense that these people have been briefed and trained about how to conduct you know, this profiling and all that. Yeah, but clearly, there's a huge security, you know, rearrangement or presence in the area, which mm. is commendable. Mm. But the element that is missing is the deliberate rule of the local population. You cannot win this war with just only hardcore measures. Hardcore measures often is a source of human rights violations that can attract backlash from the population and a lack of goodwill from the population. We saw it in the Sahel region. Over-securitization of the problem in the Sahel has led to failure of state to deal with terrorism. And we cannot right. repeat that here. There's a national framework and for maybe countering... just to wrap on that. Yes, for countering and preventing violent extremism. We need to have national action plans to implement that. There's a lot of talks about it. And we're waiting to see when these action plans will be outdoored. 
so that it allows everyone to get on board in terms of what to do. So for instance, where I sit in terms of civil society, I need to conduct you know, uh, programs and activities around preventing violent extremism. And the national action plans would give meaning, would put my activities into that frame so I can work and work with the state in terms of helping the local population to understand the threat and also participate in helping prevent it. Mm. Thank you, uh, uh, Mukhtar. Uh, let me come to you, uh, James Agalga, then we'll wrap up with Prof, and it, it, it will be done for this conversation. James, over to you on those two yes. points. Um, well, I think... And, and, and gentlemen, out. let me just say this. You have a minute and a half each, maximum, so make the most of the time. All right, very, very well. I think uh, Mukhtar has said a lot about um, how we can counter terrorism, right. the steps that have been taken um, so far. Uh, it's uh, been spot on. Well, first of all, let me um, tackle Boku. And Boku clearly has uh, made the point that if the care is not taken, Boku is um, one particular factor which could open us up to um, terrorism. And that is a fact. We consider the strategic location of um, Boku in particular. I would want to say that government's approach to dealing with the conflict in Boko, in my own estimation, um, has not been um, with the kind of um, you know agency that I, I, I should think they should ought to have attached to the crisis over there. Why am I saying so? It appears government's approach now. And with, with, in, in terms of dealing with the Boko crisis, is to enforce law, the law enforcement approach, I think is a strategy that they're using now. In terms of uh, um, promoting peace through dialogue, etc., I think we're lacking in that regard. And something urgently needs to be done. The other day, uh, we decided to embark upon a trip, I mean, from Parliament to Boko. Unfortunately, we couldn't make the trip because the Air Force had some challenges. So we had to um, call off the trip and reschedule for another day. So our, our, our desire is to to Boko, meet the warring faction, talk to them, and see whether they can begin to draw joy. And they used to have the inter-ethnic um, peace committee in Boko, which has since collapsed. Why can't we bring back the Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee in, 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 in Boko? I don't see a lot of effort being made in that direction. We have the Peace Council making some interventions here and there, but Peace Council is one body that is heavily under-resourced, heavily under-resourced. And so are we making special provisions to ensure mm. that Peace Council is able to intensify its activities in Boko, I don't see that happening. Right. But um, having said that, um, Mukhtar made reference to the framework for countering violent extremism and terrorism. We have the National Security Strategy. Yes, these are excellent documents. 